Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. The election is just a few days away, and one of the issues people are weighing as they consider who to vote for is, of course, U.S. foreign policy. And one of the issues that is at the heart of U.S. foreign policy is the attitude of the United States towards Israel and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now joining us to discuss U.S. foreign policy and coming elections in the studio is Miko Pellet. He's an Israeli-American activist and author. He's the author of the book, The General's Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here. So for those of you who don't know Miko, Miko's uh, father was a very well-known general. He came from a very prominent Zionist family in Israel. Um, after uh, the Lebanese war, and he was in, in special forces himself, he uh, had enough of the Zionist occupation and turned his back on that politics and, in fact, became an activist in, in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle and uh, is now living in the United States, so he's got a perspective both from Israel and from in the U.S. So with the elections coming up, um, let's go back a, a little step. You were, you were interviewed by Chris Hedges a little while ago, and in it you said Bernie Sanders opened the door. Uh, what, what, what did you mean? Well, Bernie Sanders did two things that I don't think anybody anticipated a serious candidate would ever do. He did not go to the APAC convention. He, wouldn't, he didn't speak at the APAC convention here in the spring. And uh, during his debate, a crucial debate with Hillary Clinton, he brought up the Israeli brutality and its attacks on Gaza and the fact that over 10,000 people were, were injured and thousands were killed and so forth. He did it on prime time when the whole world was watching and he had you know, everything to lose. And he did that anyway. And I think the, the kind of the, the thought or the way people are thinking about American politics, no American politician can do either of these things, criticize Israel publicly and reject the APEC um, and still be considered a serious candidate. He did both. Um, and, uh, and I think by doing that, he opened the door to other politicians to say, well, you know what, we can reject Israel. We can criticize Israeli politics and the sky is not going to fall and, you know, life will go on. Yeah, the sky did not fall. Did not fall at all. And, yeah. in fact, he came pretty close for a candidacy that no one expected to go anywhere. That's right. And then he appoints Cornell West to the platform committee here yes. uh, on his behalf. Yeah. And Cornell makes the whole issue of uh, saying there's an occupation and, yes. and trying to introduce very strong language into the platform, which wasn't accepted. But Sanders had to know what Cornell was going to do. Oh, I'm sure, he, I'm sure he knew, and I'm sure this, was, this is how he sees things. And I think the fact that the language wasn't accepted uh, has to be a warning sign to Americans as they, as they go to the polls coming, uh, you know, coming up soon. Uh, again, a, a very big division in the Democratic Party on this issue. That, that you know, there was a great number of delegates. I can't remember the exact number, close to 2,000. Uh, supporting Sanders and, uh, and you would think, supporting that taking on the question of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yes, I think, you know, Americans have this, uh, have this um, I, th I don't know if it's a blind spot or, or, or just a very indoctrination that begins very early on in life about Israel. Um, and America has just committed $38 billion over the next decade that is going to go to Israel. Um, and of course, this is in the footsteps of many, many billions of dollars that have already been given to Israel. Um, Israel is a fully developed, wealthy, you know, country, wealthy, wealthy state. It, Israel does not need uh, foreign aid at all. Uh, it certainly doesn't deserve foreign aid. Um, there is a very serious problem, um, which is the Palestinian issue, for which Israel is responsible. So today, when we look at the candidates and we try to evaluate how they view this issue and what they're going to do about this, um, from what I'm seeing, there's really only one candidate who is serious about ending foreign aid to Israel, uh, supporting boycott, divestment, and sanctions, the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against the state of Israel for what Israel is doing, Israeli policy towards the Palestinians, and that, of course, is Jill Stein. So I, I think Americans need to wake up because by not standing up clearly and opposing this aid package by not standing up clearly and opposing um, American support for Israel, they are in fact complicit with Israeli crimes because so much of our tax dollars, so much is all tax dollars. And unless we oppose it, it then, then, we're, then we are complicit in some very, very serious crimes that Israel is committing and has been committing for almost seven decades against the Palestinian people. Um, 
Some people who argue for the swing state strategy in voting, meaning you vote for Jill Stein or one of the other uh, alternative parties um, outside of the swing states. But in the swing states that, that Trump, and, and I have to say Pence, because as I've, I've said, keep saying on the real news, I think we're gonna be looking more at a President Pence if by any chance Trump actually does win, uh, in, a, in a sense of a Cheney-Bush kind of relationship. Um, but some people are arguing that, that there's a kind of traditional alliance between Netanyahu and Likud and the Republican Party and the far right of the Republican Party, which Pence and Trump is not, doesn't seem that far off, but certainly Pence and that whole gang are part of. And that there's had this friction between Obama and Netanyahu and that section of the Democratic Party. While, while no question they fully support the Zionist state of Israel and a Jewish state and the militarization and use Israel as a military, some people have called Israel like an American land-based aircraft character right, yeah. uh, carrier in the Middle East and yeah. so on. But there is a certain amount of friction with Netanyahu on the Iran agreement. Certainly Trump and Pence would have said they will they want to rip up the Iran agreement. That, that, that there is a difference within the overall unity these parties have on the support for a Zionist militarist Israel. But there is differences and some of these differences matter. What do you, what do you make of that? I think if we look historically, there is no difference on this issue and, and many other foreign policy issues actually between Republicans and Democrats. Um, the way I view it, in, uh, if we're talking about foreign policy, uh, the support for Israel and the lack of recognition of the fact that there is a problem because of the Palestinian question, um, both sides have, have you know, are, are, have, there's, there, are very, there are no differences. I mean, if we look at uh, President Obama, I don't think there's been a more supportive president for Israel ever in terms of the amounts of money and the amounts of weapons that Israel's been given. Uh, the rhetoric may be a little bit different. But I think the, the Iran agreement was a, there was a, there's a, a divergence on that. I think the Iran agreement was like, I think the whole Iran issue, or the way the Iran issue was raised by Netanyahu and raised by Israel, was uh, served two purposes. One was a smoke screen, in other words, to divert attention from Israeli crimes in Gaza and other places. And the second thing is to try to squeeze as much as possible from the Americans as much sympathy and as much whatever it is Israel can get in terms of negotiating for this foreign aid package and using the Iran deal like saying, well, you know, now you've got to compensate us even more. I don't, I don't think any of it was, was, was real. I don't think anybody had any real concerns about Israeli security because of, uh, you know, an imminent Iran threat, Iranian threat. And I don't think there was any doubt that in the end there was going to be this agreement in terms of the, the way the Israelis are thinking. But this was an opportunity to get more, to try to get more, you know, blackmail the American administration to, to squeeze more out of it in terms of what they were going to get when this, when the negotiations for the... There's an interesting you know, WikiLeaks that you know. somewhat supports what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, the, there's a WikiLeaks which, it, it doesn't say who it's from and who it's to, but it, uh, people I've talked to who s should know seem to think it looks like an internal State Department briefing. And in it, it says that uh, to get Israel to kind of go along with the Iran agreement, we should help overthrow Assad and, and, and tie this issue of overthrowing yeah. Assad to appeasing uh, yeah. Israel. And there are other aspects of foreign policy too. I mean, there's this idea that uh, somehow supporting uh, the coup leaders in Egypt means we stand with our Egyptian friends and destroying Syria means we are fighting for democracy in Syria. I mean, there's a double standard here. There's an hypocrisy here that is, that is staggering. Um, if we look at, I recall there, Israel used to uh, have a list of Arab countries that used to be referred to as the uh, refusal front. And these were the bad Arabs. These are the Arabs that you couldn't talk to, that would never make peace with us, and so on and so forth. And that list of countries was Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Libya. And now look at all these countries. On the other hand, we've got the moderate Arabs, the good Arabs, so to speak, Egypt, Jordan, um, you know, the Morocco and uh, the Gulf states and so forth, which are very willing and very happy to do business with Israel. Look at what is happening in these countries and look at what is happening in these other countries. And there's a claim that I've heard many times by, by Democrats saying, you know, we have to, we are, we are never going to forsake our Egyptian friends and the Egyptian people and therefore we are, you know, there's a foreign aid package that goes to Egypt and we support Egypt. Yet they're supporting the coup leaders 
as opposed to supporting a democratically elected president who is sitting in prison with a death sentence hanging over his head. So there's a hypocrisy there on both sides. And in terms of foreign policy, in particular in the Middle East, I don't think there's any difference uh, whatsoever on this issue. Um, and so once again, this whole claim that somehow maybe one is better than the other, uh, you know, it's just, I, I just don't see that. Okay, thanks very much for joining us. Sure. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.